made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Love that passage. It's not from us, it's God's grace as a gift. <clears throat> not by works so that no one can boast, for we are Christ, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And that's another favorite passage. You know, our standing is not because of our works, it's by grace. But we were called so that we could do good works. But that's not, that's not what saves us. It's God's grace. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of man, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has, been, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, <clears throat> we both have access to the Father by one spirit. You know, and I, I like that, that idea of breaking down the walls between people. I think that's a very important thing. Here it's specifically talking about on a basis of faith between Jew and Gentile. <clears throat> but eventually, the purpose, and we read this in the first chapter of Ephesians 2, the whole purpose of God's plan is to gather all together in one, all from all, all of humanity. The next verses are our theme verses for the, for the thoughts we're going to present. Verses 19 through 22. They read, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. As we look at different translations of this passage, um, I like the uh, contemporary English version. Instead of saying Christ as the chief cornerstone, it says with Christ as the most important stone. And uh, both thoughts are, are correct. It is the most important stone in that building. So let's examine this first on a verse by verse basis. In verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. As we read in the previous verses, Paul was describing the unity that exists between Jews and Gentiles based on what Christ had accomplished through his atoning death. 
And in this verse, he is particularly addressing the Gentiles, telling them that they are no longer foreigners and aliens, but members of God's household. Verse 20 says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Paul begins here to use an illustration or figure of the construction of a building. He says that our becoming part of the household of God is based upon the lives and the testimony of the prophets, the apostles, and Jesus Christ. They are the foundations of the building. And he says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. What is a cornerstone? Well, here's a description from Wikipedia. A cornerstone or foundation stone or setting stone is the first stone set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone thus determining the position of the entire structure. Over time, a cornerstone became a ceremonial masonry stone set in a prominent location on the outside of a building, often with an inscription on the stone indicating the construction dates of the building and the names of the architect, builder, and other significant individuals. <clears throat> Some cornerstones include time capsules, from or engravings commemorating a time particular when the building was built. I think we're all familiar with those kinds of thoughts about a cornerstone. <clears throat> Paul has written about Jesus Christ as the only foundation for our faith and our hopes in his first letter to the Corinthians. In the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, reading verses 10 through 15, this is what Paul wrote. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or stubble, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. In describing Jesus as the chief cornerstone in our theme text, it seems that Paul is drawing this metaphor from Isaiah 28, verse 16. Isaiah 28, 16, which reads, So this is what the Sovereign Lord says. See, I lay in a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation, the one who trusts will never be dismayed. A chief cornerstone, a precious cornerstone. <clears throat> you know, but if we think of a, a building, we might say, well, there's actually four cornerstones on a building, assuming it's rectangular or square. <clears throat> Another Old Testament prophecy about a special stone associated with righteousness and salvation, I think, helps provide an understanding. And this is in Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 19 through 24. It says, and again, I'm reading from NIV, open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me, you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And Jesus applied this passage to himself. <clears throat> and so we want to read from Matthew 21 as he applies this Psalm 118 passage to himself. This is starting in verses, uh, verse 42. Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. <clears throat> well, this use of the word capstone <clears throat> almost suggests that the figure in mind of the psalmist is a pyramid. Because a pyramid has in essence, five cornerstones, four cornerstones at the base and one at the top, the capstone. <clears throat> the special thing about the capstone of a pyramid is that it is a miniature or model of the whole building. And its lines and angles define what the rest of the structure will look like. It is the model for the whole building <clears throat> and how fitting an illustration this is of Christ, our head, and the church, the building, constructed beneath him following the exact lines that come from him. You know, I'm pretty certain that, that this understanding of these passages led Pastor Russell to, I don't know if we have a chart of the age, to use pyramids on the chart of the ages, you know, and some of them without the capstone until the, the finished picture there in the Messianic age. The Apostle Peter references this passage from Psalm 118 also, and the one in Isaiah 28, and a third one from Isaiah 8 that refer to Christ as a stone, a cornerstone and capstone. This is 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 10. Peter is also describing the church as being built up as a spiritual house. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices or spiritual offerings acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay in a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We might take a moment here to consider some interesting facts about the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. How many of you have been to the Great Pyramid? Yeah, a few of you, yes. It's a, a marvelous building. <clears throat> and this, this is uh, when you look up <laughs> the Great Pyramid of Giza. I'm sorry, I use Wikipedia a lot. It's convenient. 
It says the pyramid was once topped by a capstone known as a pyramidion. The material from which it is, was made is subject to much speculation. Limestone, granite, or basalt are commonly proposed. The great pyramids, pyramidion was lost in antiquity as Pliny the Elder and later authors report just a platform on its summit. Now the pyramid is about eight meters or 26 feet shorter than it would have been when it was intact with about 1,000 tons of material missing from the top. And this is the next paragraph that's just amazing. In 1874, a mast was installed on top of the pyramid by the Scottish astronomer, Sir David Gill, who, whilst returning from work involving observing a rare Venus transit, was invited to survey Egypt and began by surveying the Great Pyramid. His measurements of the pyramid were accurate to within one meter, and the survey mast is still in place to this day. Well, actually, the mast and supporting poles were torn down by a man in 2019, so they're no longer there. But it is interesting in that in the year we believe Christ returned invisibly, as a spirit being a framework outlining that capstone was set up on top of the Great Pyramid. A coincidence? Mm, I don't think so. Verse 21 says, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Paul repeats this thought in chapter four, verses 15 and 16, but instead of using a building, the temple as his illustration, he uses the figure of the human body. And we just wanna read that passage because it's comparable here. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know, so we, in that figure of the human body, we have Christ as the head and the body built up under him with the various parts and functions. And with the pyramid, the top stone is Christ there at the top, and the building is built up under him. Paul repeatedly uses the figure of the human body to describe the unity and diversity within the community of believers. We're not going to read those passages, but you're familiar in 1 Corinthians 12. He uses that illustration to talk about the church. And he also uses it in Romans, the 12th chapter to talk about the different functions and parts of the body and the different gifts that are given to each of us. However, in the temple passage, Paul uses the figure of a building, and in this case, the, or in our theme passage, the temple in Jerusalem. Because the temple was God's dwelling place among his people Israel. His presence was represented by the supernatural light that dwelt between the two cherubim on the mercy seat in the most holy of the temple. <clears throat> and that detail is important to the point that Paul makes in the last verse of our theme text, verse 22, which reads, in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Paul says that if we belong to Christ, if we are part of the household of God, God will dwell in us by the power of his spirit, his Holy Spirit. That is true of God's household individually and collectively. And Paul talks about this in, uh, in his first letter to the Corinthians as well, in chapter three, chapter three, verses 16 and 17, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. 
In the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians verses 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God in your body. In 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verse 16, 2 Corinthians 6, 16, says, but what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. You know, and that wonderful promise right there is repeated in Revelation 21, in those first four verses, talking then about all humanity. So we have the promise from the Apostle Paul and John that God, by his Spirit, dwells within each of us if we acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and our Savior and, and if we love one another, which John spoke of in opening the convention. The dwelling of God place of God in Revelation is in the figure, a different figure, the figure of the New Jerusalem. <clears throat> in Revelation 21, verses 9 through 14, it reads, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb, and he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And this dwelling of God in the New Jerusalem is spoken of prophetically in Psalm 46, verses 4 and 5. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. So what applications can we, can we draw from this passage about the foundations that we are built up on to be a dwelling place of God through the Spirit? Our passage speaks about this foundation of the prophets, the apostles, and our Lord Jesus Christ. What should we be building so that we can be a dwelling place for God by his spirit? It is important that we understand the details of God's plan of salvation so that we can have confidence in our own salvation and the opportunities it presents, and also to be able to give an explanation to others for the hope that is within us. The prophets, apostles, and our Lord have much to say about God's plan and what he is doing and where we are on the stream of time. And when I think of the building and shaping and polishing of the individual stones that will make up the spiritual temple in the New Jerusalem, I think mostly about what we are building in terms of our character and the prophets and the apostles and our Lord Jesus have had much to say on this subject. And we will consider selected passages containing this kind of counsel from these foundations. Sometimes I think we can get maybe too caught up in striving to understand all the details and prophecies about the mechanics of God's plan. And I think Paul refers to this in one passage in Hebrews as the milk of the word. And that we don't put enough emphasis on what Jesus called the more important matters of the law. In Hebrews 5, 
verse, verse 12 through 6, 3, this is what the account says. Hebrews 5, 12 through 6, 3. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained their, themselves to distinguish good and evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so, to go on to those things of maturity. And in Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, dill, cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You have, should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So we, we need both. But character is the purpose of all of this building work that is going on within us. We want to be like the man Jesus described in Luke 6, who built his house upon a rock. And when the storms of life came upon it, it survived because it had good foundations. Well, what testimony and counsel can we draw from the prophets? Two passages in the Psalm tell us about the foundation of God's throne. In Psalm 89, 14, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. So there are some important characteristics that we should be building into our character. And in Psalm 97, the first two verses said, The Lord reigns, let the earth be glad, let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Isaiah in the ninth chapter tells us the good news about a coming time of peace and righteousness when Christ will be king over the earth. It's a familiar passage which is often used at uh, Christmas time. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. I'm just going to read verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. We have this repetition of justice and righteousness. And we've spoken before here at this convention, maybe it was the last time we were here, a few years ago, about the nature of God's justice, that it is a restoring justice. It's not merely punitive justice. It's something that is designed to restore and make someone whole. When he's called the Prince of Peace here in verse 6 of this passage, the word there is shalom, the Prince of Shalom. And shalom doesn't just mean the absence of conflict. Shalom involves the thought of everything that is good for a person to make them whole and complete and healthy, spiritually and physically. Daniel also tells us that this kingdom, this government, will come and never have an end. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite passages, Daniel 2.44. Years ago at the uh, Midwest Bible Student Youth Camp, it was the theme scripture. And I remember that year, Jan was put in charge of crafts for the Midwest Bible Camp, and we made t-shirts with the scripture on it. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms, bring them to an end, 
and it will itself endure forever. What a wonderful promise. And we're just going to cite it, but we all know the wonderful prophecy in Micah 4, verses 1 through 4, or Isaiah uh, chapter 2. two. Um, same prophecy about the last days and beating their swords into plowshares. The word of the Lord going forth from Jerusalem. Anyway, wonderful prophecy that gives us this foundation and understanding what God is doing and inviting us to emulate him and his dear son as we build our character. When we think of the foundation of the apostles, and we read that they were their names are on the 12 foundation stones of, of the new Jerusalem, we have much counsel and the, from them that helps us to build our character. And, and, and this first passage from 1 Timothy, the first chapter, verses 15 and 16 and 17 is one of my favorites. It says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst, Paul says. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example of those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This passage, I think, is a real rebuke to many people who profess to be Christians, but think it is their duty to publicly condemn those who believe differently and those who they believe are terrible sinners. Christ Jesus came to save those people, including us. This is a deep, important truth, brethren, and it should be a touchstone for our testing every thought and idea that passes through our brain. The saving of people, all people, is the purpose for which Christ came and died. This is the central element of God's plan. And so I think as his people, we should not entertain limits as some do to the fulfillment of the ransom provided by Christ. The apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone, everyone to come to repentance. And I think of the limits that many Christians see in their understanding of what God is doing, that they place limits on, this, on God, that he can't accomplish what his spokespeople say is his intention. In 1 Peter 2, where we read the wonderful passage about Christ Jesus being, giving himself as a ransom for all. In the previous verse, verse 4, it says, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> Paul expressed the power of God's salvation in another passage that I believe is one of the best summaries of God's whole plan. If I want to cite a scripture that I think encapsulates in few words, human history and what God is doing, it's this passage, Romans the eighth chapter, verses 18 to 21. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us for the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation will itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And I had a long opportunity to share my faith with the uh, chaplain 
at the uh, Dane County Jail, the county we live in in Wisconsin, at a meeting. We talked for 45 minutes. We talked about the permission of evil, and I cited this. I said, see, there's a purpose. He subjected the creation to futility in hope that it would eventually be set free. And I, then I remembered I had a Why God Permits Evil booklet in my, in my computer bag, and I pulled it out, and I said, that, that's what this is. He said, oh, can I have that? I said, that's why I carry it around here. And I said, you know, if you want to share that around uh, the jail, I can supply you with more copies. Uh, he hasn't asked, but, but then he told me about a, a book. He says, you know, there's a book. And he says, that's the theme scripture of the whole book um, by someone that he, he mentioned to me. Anyway, it's a wonderful statement to explain what God is doing and why he permits evil. How are we doing on time? We're just about running out here. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip over a lot of other examples I have here because <clears throat> uh, what do we have from Jesus Christ? Well, on the point that I emphasized a moment ago, you know, we see John 3.16 on billboards, you know, I love it. Why don't they put verse 17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through him. <clears throat> you know, when I look at the parable of the sheep and the goats, I think that the those who were determined to be sheep were those who valued the lives of others enough to take actions, not words or thoughts and prayers, action to help others who were in need. One of the lessons of that parable is to receive salvation, to save your life, you need to show that you value the lives of others through your actions. And of course, Jesus gave us much counsel in the Sermon on the Mount that we've got many excerpts down here on our paper. <clears throat> and we don't have time to go through them. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think I would just like to, uh, you know, cite, again, John referred to this earlier in his opening remarks. In John 13, the new commandment that Jesus gave John 13, 34, and 35, a new command, I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And you know, we have several passages about, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that was from the Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think, as I read this, love one another as I have loved you. I think Jesus' love for his neighbor, he loved his neighbor more than himself. Not just as himself, but Jesus in his sacrifice loved the lives of all these people more than his own life. And I think that's what we're called to do. Well, brethren, these are just a few examples of the foundations, truths, and counsel we have from the prophets, the apostles, and our Lord Jesus. The chief cornerstone, the capstone, the one who we want to align our lives with, that we can be that spiritual building in which God dwells by his spirit. May God help all of us to live build and grow based on these foundations. May the lines of our character reflect those of the character of Jesus, the model of the whole building. And as a final point, as I was preparing these thoughts, I found a not surprising contrast to our theme text in Jeremiah. Let me read that for closing. This is Jeremiah 51, verses 24 to 26. Before your eyes, I will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylonia for all the wrong they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. I am against you, O destroying mountain, you who destroy the whole earth, declares the Lord. 
I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you off the cliffs, and make you a burned out mountain. And here's the point. No rock will ever be taken from you for a cornerstone, nor any stone for a foundation, for you will be desolate forever. That is not where the stone that we follow is taken from. It, Babylon does not provide the foundations that we need. Pray that the Lord might bless these thoughts to all of us as we go forward as disciples of Jesus.